Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's no secret that I'm a Star Wars fan, and I want to tell you the story about one particular artifact which is used to make a Star Wars prop. And any Star Wars fan can tell you that this character is IG-88, an assassin droid, a bounty hunter, who appeared in one scene in Empire Strikes Back alongside a bunch of other cool-looking bounty hunters, clearly individuals who are badass enough to get asked personally by Darth Vader to go hunting for Han, Chewie, and Leia. And of course, in the case of Boba Fett, he needs to get reminded about the no disintegrations rule. Now, in the original trilogy, the character only appears in that one scene and doesn't have any lines. But as the universe expanded, we got to know a lot more. And in The Mandalorian, we have a character whose designation is IG-11, and essentially the same model of assassin droid. And thanks to modern VFX, we get to see it kicking ass and shooting everybody. So anyway, the real Star Wars like behind-the-scenes nerds will know that the head of this droid is built from a piece of a jet engine, specifically the flame tube liner from a Rolls-Royce Derwent jet engine. And also, this got used for a drink dispenser prop in the background of Moss Eisley Cantina. And the real prop nerds will know that the balance tube from this is used for the business end of Obi-Wan Kenobi's lightsaber. And while that's all fascinating, that's where most articles stop. Whereas I'm actually kind of interested in propulsion. And a lot of you might wonder, well, wait a second, what exactly is a flame tube? And what is a Derwent jet engine? And how does it actually work? And that's what I'm here to talk about today. So most of you have probably guessed that a flame tube is the portion of the jet engine where the flame happens, where the fuel is actually burned. So the 30 second version on how a jet engine works is at one end you have an air intake and that air then flows into a compressor which raises the pressure of the air. Then that air flows through a combustion section where you burn fuel, it raises the temperature of the air and then that air is allowed to expand through a turbine. As that turbine is turned it's connected by a shaft to the compressor so the compressor is driven that way. And then the hot exhaust gases are allowed to expand through a nozzle generating thrust. Now, I hope you've carefully studied and absorbed this diagram because the engine we're actually talking about looks nothing like this. So the Derwent engine would be used in the Gloucester Meteor, Britain's first jet-powered fighter. It entered service on July of 1944, but it didn't really get out beyond the front lines, mostly because they were worried if it was shot down, there would be you know, secrets to be found from its cutting-edge propulsion technology. Some of the early Meteors used a slightly different engine, the Rolls-Royce Welland, which was closer to Frank Whittle's original jet engine design. One big distinction here is that the flame tubes are reverse flow, which means the air flows to the left and then flows back to the right as it burns. The engineers had some ideas on how to improve this, and the result was the Derwent. Now, I do have this footage showing a cutaway engine, which gives you an idea of how the interior of the engine is set up. This isn't a Derwent engine. So the original Derwents had like 2,000 pounds of thrust. I think they got it up to like 2,400 by the time it was like deployed. This is the Rolls-Royce Neen, and this was a scaled up larger version that was completely redesigned. Uh, it generated 5,000 pounds of thrust. It was the most powerful engine in the world at the time. Now, when they went to make the Derwent Mark V, instead of redesigning the Mark IV Derwent, they took the Neen and they scaled it down with all the new changes and improvements. And they got 3,500 pounds of thrust. That was a massive increase in propulsion capability. This was a cutting edge engine out of the time. And the Neen would have a worldwide impact because after World War II, the Labour government was interested in improving relations with the Soviet Union. So they exported like 20 of these, which were promptly disassembled, reverse engineered, and they became initially the Klimov uh, RD500 and eventually the Klimov VK1, which powered the MiG-15. But anyway, as I said, this was scaled down to make the Derwent, and there we go, there is the flame tube liner, which is used in that movie prop. So I'm basically going to use this as a stand-in for the Derwent, because I have awesome and cool footage of it. First, let's talk about why this looks so different to that diagram I showed earlier. This is the compressor section. And the compressor on the Derwent is not an axial flow compressor with fan blades that we see on modern jet engines. It is a centrifugal flow compressor. The air actually flows in through the side of the engine and then gets turned 90 degrees in towards this big impeller disc. 
At the time, this was felt to be the easier solution. So this, obviously, this is spinning very fast. And as the air flows in through the hub, it's flung out towards the outside, increasing the pressure and the velocity of the uh, air. Now, typically, these uh, type of centrifugal compressors give compression ratios of about three to four to one. Whereas the more common axial flow design, axial because the air flows down the middle, each of these stages gives a compression of about you know 20%. So you have to have lots and lots of stages in sequence to actually get the compressions you need for the combustion section of the engine. And this diagram is great because it actually includes pressures and temperatures and speeds. So the air is flowing in at A. As it hits the B section, that is where it is being accelerated by that centrifugal compressor. The air flows around to the outside to C, and at that point you'll notice the pipe expands. And as it expands, Bernoulli says that the uh, airflow has to slow down. And as it slows down, the pressure increases. So it goes from 455 meters per second, two and a half bar at the outer edge of the compressor, to 88 meters per second and 4.4 bar just before these flame tubes. So the flame tube's job is to take the high pressure air that enters at one end, burn fuel with it, make sure that by the time the gases reach the other end that they are completely combusted and they're mixed enough that the temperature has dropped to something that is usable by the turbine. And to do this, they split the air into three parts and mix it in such a way that it produces a standing flame that doesn't move down. And then beyond that, there's mixing and cooling going on. So at the top, there's the fuel injector and a series of swirler veins. And what that does is the air flows over it and it creates a more turbulent flow. The air flowing through the top is called the primary air. So this produces a flame that is about 2000 Celsius. Also note, the reason, one of the reasons why you split the air up is because you have to have the correct fuel to air ratio for combustion to happen. If you just dumped all the air in there, you might literally blow the flame out and it wouldn't burn at all. So now the next important bit to see is this waste where it sort of narrows and there's a whole bunch of holes. The air that flows into the tube before that is the secondary air. And this sort of waste section is designed to have the air sort of flowing inwards and it creates this sort of toroidal mixing flow that helps mix the propellant and also helps keep the flame up near the top of the tube rather than progressing down the middle. Finally, everything that flows in beyond this point is called the tertiary air and it's primarily there to just mix and cool the output so that it will hit the turbines at a temperature of about 837 Celsius, which is much more manageable for material science. And again, this is what it looks like in the Neen. So there are nine of these flame tube assemblies placed around the outside and only a couple of them will have ignition systems. But each of the flame tubes is linked by a pipe called a balance tube. It's this special tube and there's another one on the other side. And these are basically direct links with neighboring flame tubes. So once one of them is started, the flame will propagate sideways around to the other tubes and make sure that the whole engine gets lit during startup. And that is the component which was used to make the emitter side of uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi's lightsaber. So I hope you all found that as fascinating as I did. The combination of engines and Star Wars. You know, this is the kind of thing that next time we're around some Star Wars geeks, you'll be able to get ahead of their knowledge of Star Wars. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.